Welcome everyone to our partner session. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I'm really excited about this one today. Uh, we're going to talk about user experience and e-commerce, designing a site that converts with Joe Leach. Uh, I'm Levin Mejia. I work at Shopify as a designer advocate, and I've been running these partner sessions, and I was just mentioning that we've had a record number of signups for this one today. So thanks to everyone who continues to come back and visit and watches our webinars. We will be recording this session in case you have any technical difficulties with the video, and we'll make it available to you within a week or so. So, on to our guest. Uh, we have Joe Leach. He's a UX consultant in Bristol, UK. I also wrote here, Joe, that you are a writer and speaker as well. Um, and I do, yeah. I'm thrilled to have you here uh, and do this presentation for us. Um, and with that, I'm going to escape from my presentation, Joe, and I'm going to make you a presenter. And like I said to okay. anyone joining in, if you have any questions, we'll try to answer them. Towards the end, there's a question panel on the GoToWebinar meeting uh, panel, and uh, you'll be able to post your questions there, and I'll be managing those throughout the session. So, Joe, I'll make you a presenter. And with that... Uh, I'll hand things over to you. Okay, great stuff. Okay. Can you just checking you can see my screen okay before we start? Yeah, it looks great to me. Looks great. All right, wonderful. So, uh, hello, everybody. Um, yes, yeah, so we're going to chat um, about user experience and e-commerce. For the next probably about 30, 35 minutes, I'm going to talk, and then there'll be a bit of time at the end for questions. If you have got questions, drop them in the question window um, over to the right-hand side there, and... Levin will pick them up and share them, and we can chat through any questions you've got at the end. Um, so probably the most obvious question you've got at the moment is, yes, that is a dog behind me. That's my dog, little dude. Um, if he starts to howl or get excited, that probably means we're running out of time and it's time for me to go. So keep an eye on him if you wouldn't mind. Um, and give me a shout or send me a message if uh, he starts to get out of control. All right, then, let's go. Let's keep going. So uh, my name is Mr. Joe. Um, my background is in user experience. I've been um, a user experience consultant for 13 years now. I studied psychology um, way back when, um, and I also did a master's course in um, human-computer interactions. That's the psychology of computers and, um, uh, and humans and how people interact with computers and that kind of stuff. That was about 13 years ago. And then since then, I have been working with clients, client services. Um, and I've worked on a number of projects. Um, both in-house and with agencies and with freelance. I work with people like Marriott Hotels, eBay, uh, Disney. And in the e-commerce world, I've done um, all manner of products on e-commerce, from dishwasher tablets to bicycles to refrigerators to clothing to caravan insurance to leg wax. Yes, really leg wax. Um, to all manner of stuff. I've worked on um, larger branded e-commerce stores, um, as well as smaller elements too. And as I mentioned, I work for eBay along across a lot of their verticals, um, as well as working on a couple of award-winning sites here in the UK, like AA, um, and bigger uh, kind of bricks and mortar stores like Clark's Shoes and Mother Care um, and um, Best Buy in the UK, as well as a number of others. So that's my experience. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to share everything that I've, I've learned over the last couple of years. Well, not everything I've learned, three things that I've learned that are going to really kind of give you a bit of background on how, on how to use UX to better uh, improve your clients' uh, e-commerce stores. All right, so what I do then, day to day, I do three things. So I spend a, a third of my time doing user research. So that's things like one-to-one uh, -one interviews, remote user research, surveys, uh, mobile research. And I've probably interviewed around about 800 people over the last few years. And I've done that across the world. Most of my focus has been in the UK, but I've done work in China, Russia, Brazil, um, all over Europe, US, Canada, wherever. So there's obviously cultural insights that I can share, um, as well as kind of just some general best practice. I spend a third of my time uh, helping organizations make the right decisions. As you know, working with clients, you can give them the best advice in the world, but if they don't believe you and don't implement it, then that's a problem. We'll talk about that today as well, because that's the, probably the biggest challenge. Um, in getting this stuff done is convincing clients that it's a good idea. And then I spend a third of my time um, rolling my sleeves up and doing actual design work. And what I mean by that is I kind of tend to stick to things like prototypes, wireframes, information flows, that kind of stuff as well. 
Okay. Um, I also wrote a book as well um, called Psychology for Designers, and it obviously it's about psychology, and it's a, uh, basically a primer on how to use and apply psychology to your design to improve your design work. Um, I'll give you some links to that at the end of the show, but it's a uh, it's quite a short book and it's quite quick to read, which is obviously great for you busy people out there, and it only costs about five bucks. Okay then, so what I won't be talking about today is this junk. So this is uh, the kind of classic stuff that you read and you see time and time again on the internet. And this is actually a bit of a joke um, by one of those kind of entrepreneurs, these kind of guys who spend all their time A, B testing the tiniest of email campaigns with about 20 users and they never get anything. They come up with all these crazy ideas. They say, if you just change this color of blue, then your conversion rate is going to go up by 3,000%. Or if you change this and do that, you're, this is going to go up by this, or that's going to go down by that. Um, and often, most of the time, it's pretty poor advice. And it's poor advice because it's based on small numbers. Um, it's often based on small stores. The advice sounds solid enough, but it never actually rings true when you hit and use that advice in the real world. So everything I'll talk about today has had some sort of real world um, application and I've had success in doing it. Um, also what we'll talk about today is although something might work in one element of e-commerce, for example selling washing machines online, that may not work for example in selling shoes or selling hotel rooms or selling SD cards or selling batteries. Every element, every uh, um, item you're selling has a different aspect to what is going to be successful and what's not. And there's no one quick fix that's going to hit everything. Well, there are the two actually, and I'll give you the two quick fixes that fix everything all the time. But there's going to be nothing like this kind of, um, here's, 300, here's a way to increase your sales by 300% based on this one neat trick. It's never that simple. It seems too good to be true. It probably isn't. All right, let's keep going. So my first piece of advice, make the pictures bigger. Now, you've probably heard this before. This is the probably the number one piece of advice that anybody who's a conversion rate optimization expert or a user experience expert will say to you to do, make your pictures bigger. All right, and here's why. So again, where have I done this before? I've done this with two large fashion um, companies, one of which is very famous for its checked pants. Um, we increased their images on their website and sales went up by quite a significant amount. I've done it with washing machines. I've done it all over the place. Here's why. So the primary one that I worked with where we did this was Ritz-Carlton. Um, and obviously making the pictures of a Ritz-Carlton hotel look bigger make the product seem nicer. You can get a lot more of an idea about the detail of what you're buying from bigger pictures. You can see from this lovely picture of this incredible hotel on this clifftop that, hey, look, there's a quiet beach that sits near, very nearby. It's a short walk to the beach. Um, it seems quite quiet. It's not in a town. There's loads of information that your users can glean from the photography that typically you would spend ages writing out in text that nobody would read. That's the benefit of big pictures, is pictures can convey an awful lot of information about what's going on. Another example. So this is uh, Gap, Gap Clothing. Um, Gap have pretty good big pictures. They could be bigger if you ask me, but they're not bad. And look, what's important about these this picture of these shorts is you can tell a lot about the shorts. You can tell a lot about the um, color of the fabric, the cut, the lines, the stitching, where they're going to sit on the leg. There's a lot of information conveyed from the image. And that, again, is incredibly important. People are looking for product information, not from the words that you write on the um, down on the right hand side, you know, the color or the size or the fit, you know, the inseam sizing. They don't care that about that stuff. What people really care about is the quality of the product. The product shines through the images. Another one. So here's some work I did a few years ago for um, a washing machine, a white goods manufacturer in the UK, selling washing machines, washing machines, dishwashers, refrigerators, dryers, kind of that big box items. Um, they won a lot of awards. They had an incredible track record in terms of sales. Yes, there's lots of stuff going on on the page, but the thing to look at here is the imagery. And what's interesting, again, again, if you ask me, the images could be bigger, but what we saw in the user research was people were using the imagery to understand more about the products. So they were not reading about this uh, Lindo washing machine. They weren't reading the words. They were looking at specifically, here's a zoomed in element. They were looking at specifically um, this little area on the washing machine to see what it could do. So rather than trusting the text about the washing machine, they were looking at what programs it had what spin speeds it had, 
uh, what the digital display looked like. And this was effectively for most users the definitive way of them understanding what the product was about, it was from zooming in on the images, not reading the text. Now, the reason this works in, in um, online is because, again, it, it mirrors real life. So when you go into a shop or a store in real life, when you're looking at buying a product, you don't go into, the, into a sh white, uh, washing machine store, pick up the manual and start looking through the manual. You don't. You go in and you look at the product. You look at the display. You open the door. You get a good feel for what's going on with that particular product. Online behavior matches offline behavior. Again, similarly, you know, if you're in a... Uh, a clothing store. You pick up the sh you pick up the shorts. You might hold the shorts against you to look in a mirror. You might go and try them on. Where possible, the bigger the image is, and again, if you can show video, um, gives you a better idea about the product. It makes the product come to life a little bit more than it would have done previously. Now, a good tip around imagery, and this is something that Appliances Online did, and this maybe is a little harder for you to do if your clients are on the smaller side. You're running, um, uh, you know, kind of quite a Projects on, a, um, projects on a shoestring, but is to, is to commission your own photography. Because again, typically, you're probably thinking, well, a lot of the, the manufacturer's photography doesn't come with this level of detail. So again, for a washing machine like this Lindo 300 here, um, it may not come with the photography at the resolution that you need it to, so your users can see this detail, and it may not come with the specific imagery you know is important, like, you know, for example, with this washing machine, the zoomed-in area of the, um, uh, the display and the controls. Again, it pays if you're selling more expensive items like washing machines for $400, $500 a go to invest in photography. If you have unique photography that captures what the product's about at high resolution, your, your users are going to thank you for it and you'll sell more stuff. All right? So make your pictures bigger. Obviously, all the time. Well, all the time? Maybe not quite. This is uh, Target, which you might recognize as their kind of US. Um, uh, pile it high, sell it cheap store. And this is for a micro SD card, which is the kind of card you slot into your camera or your phone to increase the memory. Um, big pictures important here? No, big pictures are not important here. And what I think Target have missed is point two, is that, yes, sure, big pictures work, but as I mentioned early on, there's not one piece of advice that works across absolutely everything you do. And this is the big so what and why one piece of advice doesn't walk across everything you do. Because within e-commerce, there are two types of e-commerce journey that you really need to understand to make your client sites a success. There are two types of, of purchase when people are doing these things. Okay? There's considered purchases where people put thought into that purchase. And there's non-considered purchases where people don't put as much thought into the process. Um, and what's interesting about that is that they have different, your users have different goals, different thoughts, and there's different ways to design for each different way of purchasing, considered versus non-considered purchases. Okay, let's look at the first one. So this is a considered purchase. So this is a screenshot from a real estate agent um, within the UK, and they are selling a house in London for 1.749 million pounds. As a blimey, that's expensive. That's around about. Uh, Two and a half thousand, three, sorry, three million, two and a half, three million dollars US. It's an expensive purchase. Buying a house is a considered purchase. It's not the sort of thing you do on the whim, on a whim with your credit card in the evening. You, and then you just suddenly think, oh, I'm going to buy a house. 20 minutes later, you bought a house after a couple of glasses of wine and you're moving on the internet. No, you don't, it doesn't work like that. Considered purchases take time, thought, and effort to follow them through. Okay, here's an example of a UK. Uh, real estate. Here is Zillow, which is a big uh, real estate company in the US. They've not quite grasped it in quite the same way that they have in the UK. Um, interesting e-commerce aside, if you're ever analyzing your data and if you ever spot a, a zip code, which is a uh, zip code down here, which is 90210, that almost certainly means that your international visitors you're in the US, you've got a lot of international visitors because all of us in the US, probably in Canada and Australia as well, probably in Malaysia and Mongolia, we all grew up with uh, Beverly Hills 90210, the TV show. So whenever anybody asks us for a zip code, the first one we think to put in is 90210. Um, so if you think you've got loads of Beverly Hills uh, users, you probably haven't. It's because you've got loads of international users. Anyway, the point of it is big images, big high quality images sell considered purchases. All right, another example. This is an all-inclusive um, vacation or holiday. 
Uh, similarly, again, if you look at this, what are you buying here? You're buying a product. Look at the imagery, the big imagery of that particular product. It's considered purchase. If you're spending three, four, five thousand dollars on your summer vacation, um, typically you know, it can be between five and ten thousand is the average US spend on a on a vacation. You're not going to do it with a credit card as a quick purchase. You're not going to do it. You're never going to optimize your journey if you're running an e-commerce site to sell that all-inclusive five thousand dollar hotel holiday vacation in one fell swoop. You're never going to get conversion up numbers high. You're never going to get people to go, oh, that looks like a nice holiday. Yeah, do you know what? I'm going to book that now. And they go through all the steps of buying and purchasing that thing online. It's a considered purchase. It takes time. It takes time. Uh, another example of a considered purchase as my computer decides to slow down ever so slightly. either see the spinning beach ball of death. Okay. Oh, if you can also probably hear my fan, my computer sounds like it's about to take off, which is always a wonderful feeling when you're giving a presentation. Right. And Joe, we can't see the spinning beach ball. We can still see a nice, beautiful picture of uh, this resort oh, you have. Let's leave it here. <laughs> well, hopefully this is going to my screen's gonna gonna kick itself into life. So I'm just gonna hit stop and start again. Hold on for a second. I'm no. gonna hit pause. I'll be right back with my screen. Mm -hmm. Nice. So while we're waiting for that, we can still hear your audio. So uh, I well, do have a... Good. I'll keep talking. Yeah, I, I, it's a good thing to think about a considered purchase. I'm gonna go along and talk about a couple of other examples in a second while my computer is sorting itself out. Um, but the kind of importance of considered purchases are it's not a one hit. It's not something you can expect to sell from initial contact with you as a company right through to sales process in one fell swoop. It's not going to happen in 20 minutes. It's going to happen over at least a day, if not two days, if not a week, if not months. It's a longer term um, bet for what you're trying to sell and what you're trying to do. All right, I'm going to try and... Okay, and while Joe uh, sorts up the computer, are there any questions online uh, through uh, the first bit here? Uh, okay, uh, we do have one here. And uh, Joe, I think you can still hear me. And I, we have a question here, which we'll take one in, in yep. the middle of the presentation. Uh, do you have any examples of a jewelry shop online that comes from uh, Pedro? Because um, uh, I think that one... actually. Gold.co.uk is pretty good. Okay. I know they've just spent a lot of money on their redesign. It's not bad, but it's not brilliant. But um, my suggestion, with with certainly with jewelry stores as well, is to go for bigger names. I don't know what the name of the, the biggest one would be in the US, but in the UK, certainly H Samuel is one of the bigger chains within the UK. Um, but with jewelry, um, it probably depends on what kind of jewelry you're trying to sell. If you're trying to sell high-end jewelry, thousands and thousands of pounds, that fits considered purchases. If it's cheaper stuff like, um, you know, maybe 20, 30 quid for a neck, 20, 30 pounds or 50, 60 dollars for a necklace or for a ring, something that's quite low cost, that would be a different type of design you'll need to look for. And I'll kind of come and keep talking about some of those as mm -hmm. we move through. All right. Other considered purchases are a car. Not surprisingly, you're not going to suddenly go online and buy a car. Well, unless you've had a few beers over a night, and I know people have done that. You're not going to go on and buy a car in one go. You're not going to spend £51,000, $100,000 on a car in one fell swoop. Again, it's a considered purchase. You think about the car, you decide the one you want, you go and arrange a test drive, you look at the website. It's a whole series of things that you do, so you're never going to get there quite quickly. All examples are considered purchases. All right, so here's some more examples of considered purchases, things that are going to take time for you to sell um, online that people aren't going to buy immediately. So here's some examples of them. Clothing is a good example. So people spend a bit of time buying clothing. It's not something they suddenly jump in and do. It does happen to a certain extent, but there's a bit more of a thought gone into it. Um, watches, and in this case also um, probably things like... Um, uh, jewelry fits into this as well. They they are sort of purchases that take a bit of time for people to think about and to do. Shoes, uh, mortgages, um, wine, bottles of wine and spirits equally can be the same thing. Um, bicycles, washing machines, refrigerators, all examples of considered purchases. And then on the other hand, we have the opposite. We have these non-considered purchases, and these are things that are much more spur of the moment. So these are things like 
books or DVDs or CDs or digital downloads or chocolate bars like a Twix or batteries or groceries or branded toys, things like Lego, you know, stationary pens, pencils, that kind of stuff. This is the stuff that people buy and spend a lot more, a lot less time thinking about. They just go on and they just buy them. All right? You've all been there. You've all gone on and think, oh, you know, that's the latest. Uh, I'm going to buy the new Deadpool DVD onto Amazon, but, but two, three minutes later, you've bought it. The process of going through and buying that is a very different e-commerce journey to, to buying a five, six thousand pound vacation or a hundred thousand um, pound car or a million pound house. Those buying journeys are very, very different. And the tricks that work for considered purchases are not tricks that work for non-considered purchases and vice versa. So again, non-considered purchases, if you rush people through, say, buying a brand new car in the same way you'd be getting people to buy a DVD, if you use the same e-commerce journey for both of those things, people would feel freaked out if you use a DVD or a CD sales journey or um, to, to, to buy a car. It doesn't work like that. It's not the sort of thing where you're going to whip out your credit card and go, yeah, I'm going to do that right now. Spending and speeding the journey up with a considered purchase is bad news. Although on the other hand, non-considered purchases are quick and they're speedy and they're pretty much much more straightforward and easy to do. Okay. Um, again, examples of the two. And it's interesting looking at some of the contrast between the two of them. So um, somebody mentioned the question about jewellery. I think you mentioned that, Levin. Um, the yeah. expensive jewellery, so anything costing above about $100 would be considered purchase. Anything uh, that's um, non is pretty cheap, like twenty, thirty, forty dollars, would probably be a non-considered purchase. It's the sort of thing you do quite quickly. So when you're deciding which type of um, e-commerce you're um, kind of optimised towards, are you considered? Are you non-considered? Again, may well be a continuum between the middle of them, but again, you're probably going to be one more than the other. Interesting to look at certain things that sit on one side and sit on the other side. Um, Certain things like um, refrigerators sit in considered purchases. Again, it's because people view the what they want to know what a refrigerator is going to look like in their kitchen because it's again often a centerpiece of the kitchen. A dishwasher, people will buy quite quickly. If your dishwasher breaks, you need a new dishwasher replaced by the end of the week. You are not going to spend a lot of time shopping around for a new dishwasher. You're going to buy it quick and get it delivered quick. Okay. You don't care less, you care less how it works because, again, it's not the centerpiece of your kitchen. It's different from a refrigerator. A washing machine and dryer are different. Again, you care about how a washing machine works typically because it's an item you spend a lot of time interacting. If you get one that doesn't suit you, it's not the sort of thing you need. A dryer, on the other hand, it just does one thing, it dries. You don't spend a lot of time thinking about that particular product. A uh, weekend city break hotel is, is often something you'll buy quite quickly and quite spontaneously. Because again, if you're visiting New York, you're visiting London, you're visiting Paris, it's less about the hotel you're staying in and more about the city you're visiting. So it's not something you're going to suddenly go, yeah, I'm going to have, I'm going to have one of those, I'm going to do it. You don't spend a lot of time considering. You might spend a lot of time considering Paris or Barcelona or London, but you're not going to spend that much time thinking about the hotel. Okay? A important distinction between the two helps us understand which one of these two journeys you should focus on as a uh, designer and which one your client can optimize for. All right, so again, I mentioned um, user research. And I've done a lot of user research with both of these types of journeys. So um, what's interesting about the experience customers find on considered purchases is it's something they really enjoy doing. They enjoy shopping for cars, houses, vacations, refrigerators. Um, they enjoy spending the time to doing it. So again, when you're designing, you need to design and put lots of words in there that's going to help and encourage people to enjoy themselves. You know, they, they love big pictures, they love browsing through this stuff. They like to spend their time making the purchase. Use words and imagery that supports that. Okay? Everything you should talk about in your not the sort of things you're necessarily going to immediately do on a considered purchase. You want to learn more, you want to explore the product, you want to save it for later. So the calls to action that you use for a considered purchase are different from a non-considered purchase. So again, on a non-considered purchase, again, a good example is car insurance. Okay, It's quite expensive, but it's the sort of thing we have to buy and nobody enjoys buying car insurance. Everybody hates it. So when you're doing it online, it's not the sort of thing that you particularly enjoy, you just want to get it done. And again, what I hear a lot in user research is people don't enjoy non-considered purchases. It's like a chore. It's something that they have to do. So the best thing we can do as designers is just get out of their way. We make things quick, uh, friction-free, seamless, 
we offer them the right um, uh, payment at the right time, we give them quick shipping, all of these things are things that people really value in non-considered purchases. All right, and that's this is interesting. Typically, where you get a lot of the advice you read on blogs is a lot of the advice you read on blogs is very much focused on non-considered purchases. Is a lot of the advice is around selling high volume, quite cheaply, type stuff. And again, it's a different journey to considered purchases. So again, if you read that blog post that says here how to increase your conversion by 300%, think about it. Has the person written that with a considered purchase or non-considered purchase in mind? And that will tell you if that advice is relevant to the, the stuff you're working on. All right, again, there are different things. Again, often, and this is, again, such a broad brush, um, typically considered purchases are conducted by women more often than men. Um, and typically, they can you can end up seeing this in your stats where women will spend a lot of their time um, looking through and deciding on a particular product, but then they'll give the man, the man will have the credit card generally and will pay for it. So often you can see in a lot of your stats, you can see sort of broken journeys where if you're looking at your Google Analytics, it might show that women are browsing but not buying, but men are not browsing and buying very, very quickly with considered purchases. That can often be wise because women spend a bit more time thinking about it. Us, us men, and this is obviously such a broad brush, um, we're a bit more spontaneous and again, we typically focus a bit more on non-considered purchases such a broad thing but that's typically how this stuff works um, uh, Joe just one quick question it, uh, one question course. are you going through slides again because I think uh, some people are okay uh, do you mind just uh, uh, not showing your screen and showing it again I think we were some people are yes. stuck on the previous screen sorry about that sorry it's all right we have some really good follow-up questions too coming up so I just want to uh, if we have time for those online we we'll try to get to those um, pause main screen. How do I? Yeah. Everything seems to have stopped. Here. So uh, there should be a, like a stop showing screen top uh, top panel, and then we'll just want to click. Um, go to webinar control panel has frozen. Okay. You just love this. Ah, new hardware detected. Not right now. <laughs> if not. Uh, All right. Okay. And uh, click play again. Okay. Here we go. We're back in You're business. Back. All right, I'm going to review All some right. of those slides then. You probably heard what I said. Mm -hmm. Here is the review of the slides that I've just talked about. All right, so here's some of the considered versus non-considered purchases. Perfect. Okay, Thank you. You can Jeff. kind of see the difference between the two. All right. Um, and again, back to the comments that I just mentioned, the differences between the two and the two comments. Again, considered, people need to take their time about it. Non-considered, very, very quick. Let's just get it done. All right, other things then you'll see. So with considered purchases, you'll see a typical um, 2.1 visits to purchase. Now, what's interesting about this is this is a stat that not many people measure. Often they measure conversion, which is a useful number, but if you can measure visits to purchase, that can give you a good indication of how and where you sit on a considered versus non-considered timeline. Um, this can vary. So again, if it's a very, very expensive item like a house, it can be you know five, six visits per purchase or per conversion. Um, the numbers can vary, but on the whole, you'll see a higher number of visits to purchase for considered versus non-considered. Other things that you'll see, um, you'll see a um, a, a definite um, multi-channel preference for um, considered purchases. So you'll see a lot more multi-channel um, uh, behavior. So you'll see people um, browsing on mobile, purchasing on desktop, and vice versa. You'll see a lot of movement between different channels. So they'll be doing different behaviors on different things. And they'll save something for later. They'll email something to themselves. They'll bookmark something on one platform, and they'll pick it up later somewhere else. Um, that used to be historically desktop and mobile. We're seeing a lot more tablet to mobile. Um, but again, it tends to be multi-channel in, in a considered purchase world. Non-considered, particularly mobile. Um, especially if it's things like very cheap stuff, mobile is kind of very much in the ascendancy for all of this stuff um, in terms of that. So that's, again, some of the behavior you'll see. So again, if you're in the considered versus non-considered, it tells you what to design for first. If you're a considered purchase, you need to think about all three experiences of a desktop, a tablet, and a mobile. If you're in a non-considered purchase world, start with mobile. Always start with mobile. Okay, a bit more about behaviors then. So. Stuff you're going to see with considered purchases, it's fun, okay? Um, 
people go away and they, they ask a friend or they talk to their partner, their husband or their wife, their boyfriend, their girlfriend, their family, they consult with somebody else before they buy something. They think about something, they come back later. Um, it's multi-channel. They shop around. They go and look at um, uh, other websites to see if it's something they want to buy. They read around. Um, they read product reviews. So it's product to check the product is right for them, be that a holiday, a car, all of that kind of stuff. We've all been there. And they spend a lot of time looking at the pictures as we've discussed. And typically that means they shop by quality and service. So they shop by quality of product you're offering and the service that you offer around that. So again, have you got good returns policy? Again, if you've got a considered purchase, you need to think about having a good returns policy. What is the kind of um, uh, sales support like? Have you got a telephone number? All of these things are really, really important for considered purchases, and having them on your website can, again, help you increase conversion for considered purchases. For non-considered purchases, these are things that people just want to do quickly. It's a chore. They want to get stuff done quickly. Um, it's just them doing it. They don't share um, the purchase between themselves or anybody else. They just, they're on, they do it in one, one fell hit, and they want to get it done. It's mono-channel, so they, again, if they're on the mobile, they're on the mobile. If they're on the desktop, they just get on with it, and they just do it. They shop around. Again, shopping around is a big um, uh, way to look at it, and often what they're doing with non-considered purchases is shopping around based on price. And if they don't know you, they're going to read vendor reviews. So again, if they're buying that ST card, that DVD, that CD, that T-shirt from you, they're more interested to know is, are you a reputable vendor? Is it, do I trust you? Again, not everybody's Amazon, who's got that brand presence of Amazon, but they want to read vendor reviews about who you are. So they want to know that, hey, this vendor you know, has, um, is trustworthy, that if I spend them this bit of money with them, I'm going to get it quickly. If they say it's going to be their next day delivery, it is their next day delivery. That kind of stuff is really, really important to them. Is about the vendor, not about the product in the same way. Because typically, they know what product they want, and they're coming to you just to buy it. Right? So they know they need car insurance, they're just going to buy it. They know they want an SD card, they just want to buy it. They know they want that um, Deadpool DVD, they just want to buy it. Okay? It's, and they shop by price, they often shop by shipping speed. So you need to kind of be cheap, and you need to be able to get it to them quickly and reliably for them to convert better for you. All right? So effectively, what that means then, here's the say what for all of the stuff that I've been talking about. You've heard me mention some of these tips as we've gone through. So if you're going to do this, if you're a considered purchase store, big pictures, okay, where possible bespoke pictures, pictures that you've taken yourself with a high quality camera that show the details that you know are going to sell the product, okay. If it's jewellery, it's the quality of craftsmanship, it's an extreme zoom into that particular product. If it's clothing, it's an extreme zoom into that particular product. If it's houses, it's the detail of every single room. People can zoom into it, okay? Videos fit into the same world as, as, as images, but, you know, get the images right first before you get the video right. All of that stuff is really, really important. Again, if you're selling anything with the word uh, antique, bespoke, artisan in the title, you're, you're selling a considered purchase, you need quality images to justify if it's um, artisan and it's bespoke or handmade, why is it handmade? Um, and if it's vintage, people want to see and understand the quality of something you're buying. So the image is incredibly important. They want um, behaviors like email this. So they want to email it to themselves. They want to save it for later. They want to share it on Facebook. They want a way of coming back to the item that you are selling to them. So that you can remember and they can remember where they were going to buy it from. They're not going to buy it now, so you need to give them a reason to come back. Um, where possible, if they give you your email, you need to run an email drip reminder campaign. So using tools, um, there's a number of tools out there that can do this for you. Where um, if they put something into their basket or they look at something, you remind them, you send them an email immediately, four hours later, 24 hours later, and three days later to remind them about that purchase. So again, if they're looking at that high quality um, diamond engagement ring, you need to send them email reminders so they can come back and find you. Right. Again, this works incredibly well for considered purchases. Running an email drip reminder about an SD card or some batteries or a DVD isn't going to work because the chances are they found it cheaper somewhere else probably and all you're doing is annoying them and they're going to hit that unsubscribe link or worse, they're going to they're going to hit the spam link in Google and affect your spam rating. So again, email drip reminder campaigns work for considered purchases but they work less well for um, non-considered purchases. All right. Remember that stuff. There's two different types of purchase. Um, 
offer reviews of the product, the product, the product, the product. Okay, that's what people are buying here is the product. Um, third party product reviews. So again, if your product has been reviewed in a newspaper or um, another online site with a trusted brand or by a trusted third party blogger, third party product reviews are really important because that gives people the reassurance that the product is right. And again, don't forget it's the product that people are really interested in here. Less, it's less about you as a vendor and more about the product itself. When they come back, um, you need to drop a cookie and you need to show them the previously viewed items. Okay, so if it's a considered purchase, you need to show them the, the last five things that they looked at on your site. Because the chances are, again, they're going through this process of consulting with somebody else, they're thinking about it, they're shopping around, they're printing some stuff off, they're coming back to have a look at it later. When they come back to have a look at it, that product needs to be on the home page. So if they remember who you are, they can get back to it really quickly and really easily. Okay, there's a whole world of stuff you could do around considered purchases around Google AdWords as well. Um, there's some in really interesting stuff, some advanced stuff around considered purchases where you can sort of start targeting um, people who are already showing interest in that particular product. There's lots of stuff you can do there. I'll share some links later about how that can work. But again, what it is is people are coming back to you to think about it. That is uh, behavior of a considered purchase. And again, what, what's important here about when you're selling this thing is it's about emotion and not features. So again, if you're selling that piece of jewelry, um, it's not about what type of gold it is. That isn't important. It's how that ring is going to make you feel. Um, it's about how that car is going to make you feel. It's about how that very expensive house is going to make you feel. That's, that's the important stuff is um, the stuff that's going to sell is emotion around um, some of these purchases. Again, I'll share a link about using emotion more in design at the end anyway, which is some quick tips on how to do it. And then the final tip is make it fun, make it enjoyable. Stop stop with that kind of very dogmatic, boring e-commerce language. Make this stuff seem fun. Get people excited. Talk about all being in this together. Hey, we can help you choose a great vacation, piece of jewelry, um, bespoke kitchen. Um, all of those kind of considered purchases, make it really enjoyable and fun and that we're in this together. Again, if you can use language around how we're, in, we're, we're working, we're selling together this thing, people can really get involved and, and buy more stuff from you. All right, on the other hand, okay, non-considered purchases. This is the hardest point, is that the thing often with non-considered purchases like DVDs, is these are often um, commodity-based purchases. They're stuff that people could just buy anywhere. And that makes it a little harder for you to be um, a bit more spontaneous with how you do it. And typically means people are buying on um, cheapness. Okay. And again, don't forget the difference between considered and non-considered isn't just price. It's about quality and craftsmanship and authenticity. So again, non-considered purchases are things like um, it could be the Sam late Samsung S7 phone. That could be a non-considered purchase because again, they're comparing it with other people. They may want to buy it quite quickly. If you're cheap, you're probably going to get that sale. If you have an offer of reviews, um, it's reviews of your brand, of you as the shop, of you as an organization. Why should people trust to buy this thing from you? Why should they buy these um, batteries or this latest Lego set or this latest Star Wars toy from you? What is the benefit of buying it from you versus buying it from somebody else? If it's not price, what is it that you can offer? What is it about your brand that's second to none? Is it the... Um, uh, the fact that you've got really great after-sales service, is it the fact that you can ship really quickly? But whatever it is, that needs to shine through from the reviews of the brand and the store that you're working towards. All right, other things. Um, clear shipping times. I mean, this is the obvious stuff. And again, this is the stuff you can read everywhere else on the internet, but this is why. Clear shipping times, who the shipping partner is. So again, you need to, so certainly in the um, certain locations, if I'm going to get something shipped, I prefer it to get shipped with via... Um, DHL versus a cheaper shipping partner because a cheaper shipping partner is going to smash it around. They may not deliver it on the time they said. Again, if you're choosing a, a trusted branded shopping partner like DHL or somebody like that, people will trust in that and the halo effect of the shipping partner is going to come back to you and of course shipping costs. All right, So people can get it. If you offer free shipping, you know, you're onto a winner. But clear shipping times, next day shipping, shipping partners. Again, it's all about shipping. Um, about uh, trusting the brand, um, I, because I know what I know what about and about the product. And again, we talked about reviews of the brand and why that's important. Uh, number five, easy to reorder previous purchases. So again, if it's batteries, if it's contact lenses, um, if it's um, cosmetics, if it's health food supplements, 
whatever it is, these are all examples of non-considered purchases. There's stuff I just kind of go, yeah, I'm gonna, I need some more, I'm gonna buy them. You need to make it really easy to reorder. So when they come back to the home page, there's a big box that says, buy the last thing you bought again, get it now, get it quick. That stuff works really well with non-considered purchases. It doesn't work with considered purchases. I'm not gonna go back to the Jaguar website and see a big banner which says, buy this Jaguar again. No, you have to understand this journey and choose the one that you want. Um, number six, get out of the way. Um, so no pop-ups, delays, sidetracking, rat holes, distractions, none of that crap, all right? None of the stuff that's gonna get in the way of the shopping journey, okay? No sign up to my email. No take this questionnaire. No read this latest blog article. It's just like focus very much exactly on the journey with non-considered purchases and get out of the way, okay? And the big thing here is to make it quick. Make it quick. in this world. All right, the difference between the two. Okay, how do you do it? All right, a bit more about how this works. So again, I'm gonna share this in a second. This is an article, some work I did for, um, that I shared for free on the internet, and it's about a strategy for understanding who your customers are. Again, we draw a quick portrait of these. These are called personas. On the left-hand side, the goals, what we must and we must not do, and we need to develop things like customer journeys to understand what people are doing and where people are coming through the site. And again, we look at who they are, we look at their journey, and we look at on Google Analytics at the bottom here, you can see it, this is the behavior flow, and we look out for dropout here. So again, considered versus non-considered purchases, these shopping journeys are gonna be different. The words that people use at each point are gonna be different. The bounce rates are gonna be different. Um, the dropout rates are gonna be different. And again, the personas and who's gonna buy it are gonna be different. And again, this is a persona for a non-considered purchase, okay? I just wanna buy what I need and get out, okay? We can see exactly what's going on for somebody like James. If it was for a considered purchase, we'd have a very different view of what that customer wanted, which is, you know, this is enjoyable, this is fun, I wanna share this with my husband, with my wife. You kind of get the idea. And I'm gonna share this article at the end, which is how to do a UX review, which talks about everything I've just discussed there in a lot more detail. Okay. Uh, other things that you can do. So I, I've, uh, I, sh I wrote this article last year for the Shopify uh, blog, which is top 10 UX elements to optimize your client's product page design. This is again, this is more tactical stuff around a considered purchase. So this is in this case, the pair of shoes. Here is how to design a website for a pair of shoes. Um, the question about jewelry earlier on, go to this article and copy and do a lot of the things that I've said, and this will help you sell jewelry in a much more improved way. This is some good tips for selling a considered purchase. Okay. Um, finally then, last tip three, tip three. Um, the Twix. So the Twix is a chocolate bar, as you know, and it refers to this. So this is, I'm doing some work with the uh, with MoMA, who are Museum of Modern Art in New York, and we. this is a picture of the display right next to their cash register at the end of their, um, um, the purchase journey in store. This is an example, a classic example of a Twix, okay? So when we do the redesign for the MoMA store, which is happening at the moment, what I'm gonna suggest that they do is they take these small items that are priced two, three, four, five dollars, and they add them to the, to, the, um, to the checkout page of their site. So again, if you're buying a notebook or a book or a, a lamp from the MoMA store, again, a considered purchase, why not combine it with a non-considered purchase for two or three or four or five dollars, something like a pencil or a Twix chocolate bar or an SD card or some batteries for your camera or um, some floor mats for your new car. All of these things are considered purchases that partner up really well with a considered purchase, okay? In the trade, we call these the Twix. So you can sell a Twix, you can improve a lot. So what Twixes do, and again, you can see here, this is an example of a typical cash register. Twixes are like chewing gum, the sort of thing that you buy at the end of your shopping journey. So you offer a low cost, non-considered purchase at checkout, typically about $5, and this increases what we call average order value, which is a really easy thing to improve on, much easier than conversion, weirdly enough, is if your uh, client is selling, I don't know, typically an average order is about $20. If you can increase that by $5, you can immediately see the rewards that your client's gonna like for you. So again, next time you see your client, mention the Twix to them and say, is there something that we can offer on the checkout page that will increase average order value? You can also add these on the um, product page as well. So again, 
why not buy these shoes with these um, insults? So again, if you ever buy boots, they always try and sell you the, um, the, 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 the coating buffer stuff that allows you to keep that stuff waterproof. That's a Twix. They sell it really well in stores. Um, they might want to try and sell you some more laces for your shoes. Again, all of these are Twixes, and these sell incredibly well in stores, and they sell incredibly well online as well. So again, include a Twix if you can do it. All right, some tips. These are the um, links that I've shared so far, the product page, the new, how to do the UX review. I've included the UX review twice. I don't know why I included that twice. Shopify Partners blog. There's loads more stuff here. Um, Baymod Institute, loads of interesting stuff here. Again, my three tips. Make the pictures bigger, design for considered and non-considered purchases, and introduce the Twix. Okay. Levin, are you there? Let's should we do some questions. I'll let everybody think about that for a second, if they're still there. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much. I learned so much. Uh, it got me at the very beginning. So we have about five minutes to take some questions uh, that we had here. So uh, we have a question. I think the last one was from Ryan. He says, do you have any recommendations? I'm in the process of designing a website for a higher-end brand online and in-store optical retail yeah. company. So optical is probably more of a considered purchase. For, um, it's a considered purchase, yeah. So again, uh, I have done some stuff in this world, actually. Um, the thing with, if it's optics, I don't know if that's glasses or contact lenses. If it's glasses, the key thing you need to do is let people try them on. Same with clothing. So clothing and glasses are the same thing. So my suggestion would be go and check out how some of the great fashion sites do stuff. Um, is go and see how they merchandise um, items together. So like shirts, um, jerseys, jeans, pants, how they mentioned as a whole look and think about doing the same with your optics, with your glasses as well. How do those glasses look in different situations? Are they business smart? Are they casual? And other products to kind of sell them better. Because again, if you're selling optics, it's, you know, the glasses are on your face all the time. Mm -hmm. That's the sort of thing you spend a lot of time thinking about buying. They're a considered purchase. Okay. So again, it's about selling quality and selling the emotion of buying those glasses. So go and see how big fashion brands do it and copy them. Cool. Okay. Don't copy somebody trying to um, sell it cheaply and quickly. Don't go and copy a fashion house. Uh, one here on apparel photography it says, is it better for the photography photography to be on models or clipped clean? You know, marketing shirts for men, for example. Or does it matter? Uh, good question. I've done a lot of work with eBay fashion on this. It depends. Um, if it's a T-shirt um, and you can get the sizing right then generally the t-shirt on its own can work quite well. If it's men buying it, that often is the case. If it's something for um, for more involved like um, jeans or pants or typically it's something that's more of a uh, purchase by a woman because, again, I know very broad brush, but men spend less time thinking about their clothes, is you um, you definitely show it on the model. Um, so, again, you show it on the model and you show people, ideally, if you can get videos of them walking with it as well so they can see the fit and how it moves when they walk. That's the thing that people are looking for is the cut. Where's it cut on the wrist, on the leg? Where's it sit on the waist? That stuff you can only really get from pictures on models. So if it's a plain T-shirt um, with a cool design on it, that's different from a um, clothing where it tends to be model-based, I would always say. Hmm. So again, always with these questions, it depends. There's no perfect way of doing it. There really isn't. It depends on the, the type of apparel you're selling, who you're selling it to, and their kind of mindset, which is why that UX review stuff that I shared you earlier on will help, help you get into the mindset of who your user is so you can answer these questions for yourself a bit more. Great. Uh, we have, Thanks, Neil, for that one. And now we have Jennifer Chan. Uh, she asks, do B2B purchases also fall in the considered purchase category? They do. So I'm working with a big uh, software vendor at the moment called Alfresco, and they do big document management software. Um, yeah, they are very much a considered purchase. You're not going to, and again, with B2B, the B2B, the big thing about B2B purchases is they know it's on a credit card. Um, they don't. They, Because, again, typically, if you're buying something on a credit card, that's generally your personal credit card, and you have to go through the expenses policy of buying it. So, yeah, they, they skew much more heavily to considered purchases, uh, B2B stuff. So use the stuff that I talked about earlier on. Great. Um, and those tips will work. Don't use the kind of standard e-commerce stuff. Um, it's very much a considered purchase, a B2B one. Awesome. We'll take two more questions. Uh, we have one here from Mary. She says, what about selling secure cloud-based storage memberships? 
both considered, but the pricing is low, something like $100 a year. That's an interesting one. No, that's quite high. Um, um, it probably sits, again, it's probably on that continuum. Um, again, my suggestion to you would be, would be build up a persona of who your typical user is and think about how they would purchase it. So what are their goals? What things must you do? What things mustn't you do? That article I showed you earlier on. Um, look at that one. So in, in this one here, uh, how to do your X review. Look at that article there, and 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 build together a picture of your personas to sort of figure that stuff out. My feeling is it's probably more slightly more considered than non-considered. Subscriptions tend to be there. If you're charging by the month, it converge it can veer, it can veer into non-considered. If you're charging a flat hundred dollar fee, it converges into considered. So it probably depends on how people are buying your your cloud software backup solution. Um, Again, if it's four dollars a month, non-considered. If it's a hundred dollars a year, it's considered. So, when you're pricing it and the preferred pricing model you want, it's going to it's going to skew which way you look at which way you want to sell. Um, again, I wish I could give more consistent advice, but it's more mm. like it depends on who your what your industry is and who your users are that will tell you if you're considered versus not. And in the case of software, it's probably a little bit of both. Okay, awesome. Okay, I think there's one here is. I know we like to learn from others. Have you seen any examples? Let me just get the exact same question. Do you have any good and bad examples of an e-commerce subscription model journey? Hmm. Oh, let's think about subscriptions. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been working on one at the moment. So again, subscription things are, um, there's two ways to think about it. So there's the first thing with subscriptions, you have to get them through the door. So there's the first thing you have to do to get them to sign up. And in that case, typically the, the yeah, I'm trying to think of good examples of how this is done. Um, magazines do this pretty well. So again, if you look at how a magazine keeps up a, a subscription service, if you sort of see some of the um, stuff they do to keep you um, signed up and some of the stuff they keep giving you throughout the process of the journey, um, typically, they're very, very good at getting that stuff signed up and getting it done. Um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of good examples. I mean, some of the ones I've seen that are better are people like Basecamp do that quite well, right. um, software as a service. But again, that's probably the same people that you're already looking at. Um, my suggestion and my feeling is probably I don't think anybody's doing it well. I'm working with a big magazine publisher at the moment that's moving into digital download sales and subscription stuff. And we've not found anybody that does it hugely well. And that typically means because it's not being done well and we've not figured it out as an industry. Um, the key thing is to get the benefits right. And you're selling benefits, you're selling emotion, you're selling, hey, I, I got it, this, this is what we did. We made you feel part of a club. So part of the subscription service was not only that you were buying a product that you kept up to date with every week, every month, but you were part of a membership club. So we, we kind of made it feel like you were together with this other great group of exciting people, like people who are um, all doing backups together. You're the smart gang. We're all in this together. We're all the smart gang because we're all paying for memberships to do this stuff. So what you can do and you can think about is being thinking about us as a group together doing this stuff and talk about it being more like a membership rather than a sub subscription. So again, you're service, which is the subscription part, you're being part of a club, which is the membership idea, which means we're stronger together when we do this stuff. And that stuff works very, very well in terms of subscription members is, is being part of a club rather than mm -hmm. getting something drip fed to you. Um, a day we do it pretty well with their creative cloud stuff. They make it feel more than it being just something where they take money each week for a each month for a service. You're part of a bigger movement. And that's the feeling you want to get across. Right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Joe. That was excellent. Uh, thank you for the question. Sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but I'm sure we'll do a follow-up anyway. Um, so, yeah, with that, thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks, Joe, very much. And uh, definitely continue to visit the Partner blog for more announcements of future Partner sessions to come. We have exciting... Uh, oh, and also, yes. we're, we're, mm -hmm. we're going to share all of this stuff, aren't we? We're going to share a video of this. I'll share my slides, mm -hmm. all of that stuff to all of the attendees. Will we send them an email about that? Yeah. What's the best way for them to get stuff? You can expect an email from me in a week's time when we have all this together and we have the video edited. Um, but, Joe, thank you so much again for uh, yeah, this. I, I learned so much. And a lot of things I think that people can start implementing right away. And with that, uh, everyone have a good day and see you at the next partner session. You too. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye, Bye now. Everyone.